Hello, my name is Gonda van Steen and I'm the Korais Chair of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature at King's College London. And I'm in the distinct position, uh, I'm wonderfully excited to be able to introduce you today to the 30th Annual Ransomen Lecture, a brilliant institution associated proudly with King's College London, thanks to the generosity of Matty and Nicholas Egan. Matty, who regretfully is not with us, she wouldn't otherwise have missed a single lecture, but the Egan family has generously secured the legacy of this wonderful institution and we're already celebrating the 30th annual Ransomen Lecture. And talking about celebrations and anniversaries, this lecture, the topic of it, and of course our speaker, fit wonderfully well in the framework of the bicentenary celebrations. The bicentenary of 2021, celebrating 1821, or the outbreak of the Greek Revolution. It is therefore all the more special that I can introduce my esteemed colleague, Professor David Ricks. David, who doesn't need an introduction, but I will insist on it nonetheless. David is currently Professor Emeritus of Modern Greek and Comparative Literature at King's, where he is also a fellow of the college. He is a pioneer in classical reception before the word even became fashionable. His work on the resonances of Homer in modern Greek poetry is unparalleled. It found fruition in his book, The Shade of Homer. And David has gone on to other work in collaborative volumes such as Byzantium and Modern Greek Identity and the Making of Modern Greece. He was the founder of the journal Dialogos, and it speaks to his keen interest to place modern Greek literature in a broader comparative dialogue, Dialogos dialogue, with other literatures. And he continues his generous and time-consuming editorial work on the journal Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, the current flagship journal in this area in the UK and with a global reach. David continues his work of reading, interpreting, translating and critiquing modern Greek poetry. And he covers a vast range and uh, by me mentioning just a few names and titles, you will appreciate just how widespread his expertise is. David ranges from Dionysa Critis to Eratokritos, Calvos, Solomos, Cavafi, Sicilianos and more recently Vayenas and Ganas. But one contribution that is always mentioned and that I need to mention as well about David is his unparalleled role as a mentor to close to 40 doctoral students over a lifetime of dedication. And these people are now in diplomacy, in the cultural world, in academia and in, in the world of letters in general. And it is actually therefore especially um, significant that one of David's very uh, fellow students in our lands, Dr. Dionysius Capsalis, will be able to give us the word of thanks, the vote of thanks. He is a King's graduate who went on to become the director of the Cultural Foundation of the National Bank of Greece. And he is also engaged in writing essays, translating poems, uh, writing poems himself, and he's tackled that difficult branch of translating for the very demanding Greek stage, for which I have a special appreciation. His translations there of Shakespeare are prize winning, as is his work on Samuel Beckett. So today then, the special treat of David Rick's lecture with the title The Shot Heard Around the World, The Greek Revolution in Poetry, followed by the vote of thanks by Dr. Dionysius Capsalis. I'm especially grateful to both of our speakers for bearing with us as we discover the pitfalls and advantages of online delivery of lectures. But it has the beautiful advantage of being us being able to share this recording with people far and wide and you listeners being able to go back to the intricacies of what promises to be a fascinating lecture and to be able to share it with colleagues and students anywhere anytime. So welcome 
and thank you for being with us. The shot heard round the world. The Greek Revolution, launched 200 years ago next month, did indeed get the world's attention. But the precise phrase was, of course, about a precursor revolution. Here, once the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world, is from Emerson's, whose Concord hymn was hung on, sung on the 4th of July, 1837, uh, at the newly completed monument commemorating the battles of Lexington and Concord in 1775. The poetry of the nation state, which the Greek War of Independence, what we're called the 21, ushered in, has itself been heard around the world, though less, you'd expect me to say this, than it deserves. I'll be concentrating tonight on poetry by Greeks. Foreign Philhellenes are surveyed by my more learned colleague Rosa Mucciniata and myself in a piece now in press, and Anglophone writers in particular are the subject of David Rosell's acute book and astute book in Byron's Shadow. It's my hope that hearing something of modern Greek poetry tonight will be of interest to those less familiar with this tradition and at the same time offer something for the connoisseur. We shall also, as you'll see in the final poems I discuss, honestly face those forms of misunderstanding which historically can an issue in bloodshed and which are bound up with any revolution and its legacy. Our lamented donors, Nicholas and Matty Egon, not only supported, but exemplified transnational understanding through this lecture and in many other ways, as of course did Stephen Runciman himself. This is the 30th Runciman lecture I've had the pleasure to attend, if I can be described as attending it now in its virtual form. And I remember as an early one dispersed, I remember seeing Sir Stephen's nonagenarian shanks nimbly boarding a route master bus on the Strand. But of course, this is sadly the first Runciman lecture at which none of the founding trio is present. They are not forgotten. Many Runciman lectures have appealed brilliantly to the eye. Today's is directed to the ear. And for that reason, while I'll present all the poetry in translation or sometimes paraphrase or summary as appropriate, I feel it my duty to quote recurrently, though briefly, from the Greek originals as I go along. I think it's very important to do this in a culture, including an academic culture, which is resolutely monoglot. In the discussion that follows, my debts to others, including very many former and current members of this college, will be evident, which isn't to say, as the usual disclaimer goes, that they will agree with what I have to say. So let me start, let me jump right in by quoting the opening of a Clephtic song, a song of Greek bandits. It's the song of Chronis from the 1790s. Pola tu fekian divogun milionia cariofilia, mina se gamo peftune, mine, mina se panihiri, cudes to gamo peftune, cudes to panihiri, alit sicura sierete, que lignis to simavi. Many musket shots shall sound out, long guns and flintlocks. Are they ringing out for a wedding or for a fiesta? They are not ringing out for a wedding or for a a fiesta, Ali Tsikouras is amusing himself, shooting at a mark. The tale told in this lecture, which concerns the historical experience of the Greeks and their poets' responses to that history, from the period just before the revolution right up into the 1960s, is the story of the gun. The traditional song I've just quoted is vivid, both rhetorically, with its use of the question and answer form that goes right back to Homer, but also for its exuberant mention of three kinds of gun, dufekia, muskets, or in modern context, rifles, milionia, long-barreled flintlocks, and cariophilia, a more common type of flintlock. Clearly, this isn't the precise inventory of an arsenal, but rather the expression of a general love of the gun. Along, of course, with many other factors, it was that love of the gun which won Greek independence. Along, of course, with many other factors, it was that same attachment to the gun which made so much of Greek history up into the mid 20th century so sanguinary. There are paradoxes here. You'll have noted perhaps that in the song just quoted, the gun owner is a Muslim. More importantly, it's clear from the song that the default setting for gun use is not in fact combat, but a wedding or a religious feast. Cretans still cleave to that tradition you can drive through Crete seeing signs which proudly announce no shooting at random, 
and each sign is riddled with bullet holes. As historians of the revolution have related, those old guns, heavy to lift, hard to clean, were rarely fired in anger and often put their owners in greater danger than those at whom they were discharged. Like the concubines in Gibbon's famous jest, they were for use rather than ostentation, but ostentation too was important. Such guns, sometimes as beautifully adorned as a sanctuary screen of the period, were greatly prized and now command a king's ransom. Their resonance is elo eloquently conveyed in a celebrated passage from the memoirs of one of the men of the 21, General Maglianis. In his opening chapter, he relates how at the age of 14, he was at the festival of St. John Baptist in a market town in central Greece. Given his master's gun to hold, he couldn't resist having a go with it himself. And of course, the damn thing broke. Savagely beaten and shamed in front of the throng, he crept away to St. John's church and there, humbled in prayer, he sought of the saint, fine guns adorned with silver, along it should be noted with 15 purses of gold, and vowed to donate a fine silver candelabra in return. The promise was fulfilled, Macriani sold bread at a profit in plague time, and from his gains was able to commission a musket adorned with silver and a fine candelabra for his patron, benefactor and true friend, St John. All this before Maglianis was initiated into the revolutionary friendly society. What then of poetry? There are, it may be said, and has been said, three founding poets of independent Greece, Count Dionisio Solomon, alias Dionisio Solomos, Andrea Calvo, alias Andreas Calvos, and the collective voice of folk song uh, as anthologized in Claude Fauriel's Chant Populaire de la Grèce Moderne, 1824 to 5. With its fine French translations opposite the Greek and its copious additional materials, Fauriel's work is still a remarkable monument to poetry as it is to Philhellenic zeal. And it's no accident that the first song in it is one which celebrates an unhappy hero whose very name is taken from that of his gun, Christos Milionis. This short song ends with a dialogue between the Albanian Muslim Suleiman and Christos his Christian blood brother, whom Suleiman has been sent to apprehend. And Suleiman called out to Chieftain Milionis, Christos, the king is after you, the Argus are after you. As long as Christos lives, I pay no Turk obeisance. Musket in hand, each rushed at the other, rendered fire for fire, and fell on the spot. Metadu fekje treksat et treksan oenas prostonalon, fotja et osan stin fotja, ke pesanis ton topon. The overt reasoning for Fauriel to begin with this song, which survives only in his version, is that in his view it dates as early as the 17th century. In that sense, it is in his eyes a kind of charter for the claim that the Greeks had been nurturing the spirit of independence long before 1821. The song itself rather tells against that. It sits with many other ballads in which brothers or here blood brothers are thrown into tragic conflict. But Fauriel has another point in mind. Christus Milionis, as I've said, takes his name from Flintlock, Milioni, like uh, Pistol Pete, Frank Newton in the American West. As Fauriel mentions, the name alludes to the type of musket with which he fought, the longest barrel of which are called Milionia, his fearsome musket of which the memory is yet fresh in Akarnania. Fauriel had in fact elaborated on the gunmanship of the clefts in the long and valuable introduction to his collection. Quote, one of the exercises in which they most distinguished themselves was shooting. They possessed muskets of prodigious length and range, which they fired with remarkable and often astonishing accuracy. No few among them could, at a distance of 200 paces, be sure of hitting us at a single shot, an egg hung from a branch by a thread. This sounds a little too good to be true, but the affinity for these arms was clear enough. In another widely disseminated song published later than Fauriel, we're told, the sons of the clefts are dancing and reveling, sorry crew, but one little son of clefts plays not and dances not, but cleans his weapons and sharpens his sword. Proud musket mine and famous sword, many a time you have saved my skin, now aid me at this hour, that I may gild you with gold, that I may enamel you with silver. Du fekimu perifano, the musket takes on the pride of its owner. A comparable song expresses an ostensibly similar attitude. 
12 years at cleft, I never ate fresh bread, I never slept on pallet, I never had my fill of sleep, of sweet sleep. My hand was my pillow and my sword, my pallet, and my dear musket was like a girl in my embrace. This is easily misconstrued, though in the British Army's brown Bess musket, celebrated in a Kipling poem, we have perhaps a comparable personification. The cleftic song here actually is more of a complaint like W.H. Auden's Roman War Blues, it's really about the privations of military or here brigand life, which historians have documented in some detail. You would, of course, rather sleep with a girl than a gun if you had the chance. All in all, guns and emotional investment in guns are less pervasive and vivid in cleftic song than one might expect, except where they are unexpectedly wielded by heroines. And in the modern edition of 55 songs, just one fifth mentioned guns at all. Yet we shall find writing poets exploiting and extrapolating such hints as have been pointed to here. Choriel's then is one key publication project promoting the Greek cause in Europe in which the gun has given a central place. What of other poetic idioms? Andreas Kalvos's odes, the work of a fervent revolutionist taking aim from abroad, are central here. His Greek poems are Italian neoclassical odes, published in Geneva and Paris in 1824 and 1826 respectively, written in an eccentric home-brewed form of the modern Greek language with an archaizing character and addressed to a European public. One of the challenges for a neoclassical poetic is how you incorporate the modern, whether that be the rhetoric of the French Revolution or of course realia such as modern weaponry. Kalbus's way of handling the problem is to make the gun largely implicit, sometimes with interesting results. Take the Ode to the Muses, for example. There's a robust claim in that poem, knowingly echoing Gray's The Progress of Poesy, uh, a claim that poetry and liberty are inextricable. The Muses are presented as having deserted Greece as far back as the Roman conquest of 146 BC, with that exile only confirmed by the Ottoman conquest long after. And they now make their return to Greece only with the moment that revolution has broken out. Without poetry, the Greeks would be a timid flock. Like lightning bearing hands would be but backs patient of the lash, were the clear sounding twin peaked cave of Parnassus to fall silent. In other words, there's an affinity between the voice of poetry as mysteriously emanating from the peaks of Parnassus and the valor of the warriors who now mount the resistance from caves on that very mountain. These unlettered men, adopted by the poet with an epithet of Zeus-like grandeur, Geravno Fori Hires, lightning bearing hands, in other words, firepower. We'll take the ode to Suli, a commemoration of the Suliot irregular Marcos Bozzaris and the Battle of Carpenisi in 1823, where he fell. That really was a shot heard around the world. It was the American Fitz Green Halix poem, Marco Bozzaris, populous for so long, which introduced Robert Frost to the world of poetry. Calvus, from afar, he visited insurgent Greece just once, hears musical measures. No carefree shepherds versus these, nor of weddings, nor of reveling young men and women, nor of priests. It is another glorious feast kept today in Hellas. The angel of war is dancing, he bestows laurels. The passage both rejects and adopts the cleftic song trope we heard in the Song of Cronies, and a bit later, the song of the free men is quoted along with nature's answer, a resounding answer. So raw day and in harmony, their arms thundered and the caves. The hero Botzeris will fall, but nature herself, awoken from slumber by gunfire, echoes forth the call to rise against the Turk. Carlos's younger contemporary Solomos begins in a similar spirit, but a clumsier idiom. The superficial sense in which he's the Greek national poet is that the opening stanzas of the hymn to liberty would later become the national anthem. But he's the national poet in a much deeper sense, despite the fact that he published just this Greek poem and anonymously one other in his lifetime. The hymn to liberty was first printed at Missolonghi in 1823 and then appeared as an annex to Fourier's collection in 1825. In Solomos's description of the sack of Tibolitsa in 1822, some way into this loose baggy production, we hear of the Greeks that 
Totu fekja navja strafti, lambi kofti tospathi. On they come and there lights up the flashing light of war, musket lights up, flashing lightning, glimmers, slashes, blade. I hear the crack of muskets, I hear the clash of blades, I hear staves, I hear axes, I hear the grinding of teeth. Problem for Sora Mosto is that the sack of Tripolitsa was both the resounding and inspiring victory for the Greek arms and an atrocity which stands out in the annals of inhumanity on the both sides and was so seen at the time in Europe. Increasingly aware of the problem, the poet turned to the ideal of the Greeks as defenders of hearth and home and defenders even more so of their true spirit. In his great work, The Free Besieged, thrice attempted and never completed or even anything like finished, we might say that the poet fell in his own investment of a poetic citadel. Solomos turned to a very different event, the final siege of Missolonghi in 1826, and the valiant exodus on Palm Sunday, in which women and children led by a handful of men surged out of the starved town in a vain bid for freedom, which for the poet won the highest possible freedom. Here the gun appears in a wholly new guise, in an early section of the poem, in its initial lyric form, first working title, Missolonghi, Solomos gives us a musket that has now fallen silent, Alta Comba. Paramera stechi suliotis ke clei, argato tu fechi sicorni ke lei, se tutto to heri ti canis esi, o ectros mutoxeri os muise vari. There to one side stands a suliot weeping, slowly he lifts his musket and says, what purpose serve you in this hand? Your foe knows that you weigh it down. The second version of these lines, from what may be called Solomos's living year of 1833 to 4, so after Greek independence had been won, but Solomos, of course, writing from Corfu, still under British rule, a second version concludes more tersely. Hermo du feki skotino, tiseho osto heri, opusu muyenes vari, Sad, sombre musket, what good are you in my hand, now that you weigh too heavy, as the Hagarine well knows? The poignancy at ground level comes from the weakness of starvation. How could you raise, let alone fire, a weapon weighing 10 pounds or more? But Solomos also draws on what Foria wrote about a Suliot never leaving his arms, he ate and slept with them. It's as if Solomos has a programme, and he does, not to fill his siege with gunplay, but to concentrate on those spiritual strengths of largely unarmed Greeks, which are called on to resist bombardment and starvation. The emphasis on the non-competence in the free besieged appears in his related composition in biblical verses, The Woman of Zagidos. And it came to pass in those days when the Turks had laid siege to Missolonghi, that often the days on end and sometimes nights on end, Zakynthos stood with the shook with the heavy cannon fire. The women refugees would beg, and none said no to them, for the women's petitions were more often than not accompanied by the cannon fire from Missolonghi, and the earth shook under our feet. And the most destitute would fetch out their might and give it and sign themselves with the cross as they looked across to Missolonghi and wept. Solomos never rejected the clefts or the people's language in which the cleftic songs were composed, but he saw the individual poet's task as to do more than replicate the language or the perspective. A last and poignant example comes from his late masterpiece, The Shark. The hero in this poem is not a Greek at all, but a young English soldier of the Corfu garrison who was fatally attacked by a shark in 1847. And as the shark attacks, the poem says, Kalya makriane to spathi, makriane to tufeki, and far alas his sword and far alas his musket. This truly sidelines the gun in Solomos's mature poetic. Clearly, poetry of this kind aspires to a higher realm, but there was good verse which celebrated the ideal of freedom as exemplified by the clefts. A celebrated example is Alexander Sudhis of Sidrangabi's poem, The Cleft, later familiar as a military march. Mavri ni nichta stabunas tus brachus pestichioni. Dark is night in the mountains, snow falls over the rocks, in the wild dark places, over the rugged rocks, through the passes, the cleft unsheathes his sword. It's a rousing start, but the freedom-loving cleft must meet his doom, soon enough, just a couple of stanzas on. 
παριά, βαριά βοήζει η ένα του φέκι πέφτει. Παντού τρομάρα και σπαγή, εδώ φυγή, εκεί πληγή, τον σκότωσαν τον κλεφτή. Deeply, deeply earth resounds, musket fire breaks out, on all sides terror and slaughter, here flight their wounds, the cleft has been killed. It's a strange cultural blend. The poem, written during the revolution, published in 1837, is a rework of Schiller. The original tune for it was an old German student song sung in Latin, and the poet wrote it at the military academy in Munich, far from the Greek conflict. All worlds away from the real life of a Greek bandit, even one inspired by or enrolled in an ideal of liberty. Yet it's compelling in its own way, and James Joyce delighted to recite it, perhaps after a drink or two. It was Athanasios Valoritis, born in 1824, the first self-conscious national poet of Greece, and along with Palamas, the only undisputed holder of the title or the pinnacle of his career, who took this romantic nationalist amalgam to an influential extreme. His mission was bound up with a political stance in Korea, a native of Lefkada, he was an ardent advocate of union with Greece, and that came about in 1864. Nafer menu desti flogger tana menu du fecuton, warming themselves by the flame of their fiery muskets. The phrase gives an idea of the sort of inflated rhetoric we find in this unignorable but uneven poet. Valoritis oeuvre as a whole creates a foundation myth of cleft with his gun as a new epic of the Christian Greek race, an epic which can look the Iliad in the face. Most influential here in the invention of tradition is Ozimos Kipokariophilitou, Zimos Antis Flintlock, published in 1857, the year of Valoritis's election to the Ionian Parliament. The poem soon became familiar as a vivid aria, Old Zimos, in an opera by Pablos Carrer, which you can hear on YouTube, And that's an interesting art music development of the folk song idiom. Themos, 50 years a cleft, feels death nigh. Falaudita's poem takes a cue from a song Themos and his tomb in Foyen, and he employs the ballad meter, which has been the staple meter of Greek poetry since the late Byzantine period. In the cleftic song, Themos asks to be buried upright as a mark of his unusual valor, and so as to know from the swallows when spring is nigh. In other words, to avert the darkness of the underworld so feared in the Greek folk imagination. In the second half of Valoritis' short but verbose poem, Vimos issues very different instructions. And one of you, the youngest one, let him ascend the ridge, let him take my musket, my worthy flintlock, and let him discharge it for me thrice, and thrice may it bellow, old Vimos is dead, old Vimos is gone. I now fast forward over a patch of bog standard nature worship to the poem's famous concluding lines. Run my lad, swiftly run high up to the ridge and discharge my musket. I would even in my slumbers hear its roar for one last time. The young cleft ran like a hand hind high up the mountain ridge and calls out thrice, old Themos is dead, old Themos is gone. And as the rocks and valleys called in answer, he fired the first musket shot and then a second And with the third and last, the flintlock thunders, roars like a beast, opens up its innards, flies from the hand, creeps wounded on the ground, falls from the rocky precipice, vanishes, gone, gone. Demos heard the roar deep in his slumber, his pale lips smiled, he joined his hands in prayer. Old Demos has died, old Demos is gone. The soul of the valiant one, the fearsome cleft, meets with the muskets roar up in the clouds, they meet in a brotherly embrace. Vanishing, fading, gone. Costis Palamas, born in 1859, grew up in Misarongi, where Byron's boatman still plied his trade and was much influenced by this vein of Anoritis and other nationalist poets. His first collection in 1886, Songs of My Homeland, by which he means Misarongi as much as Greece as a whole, contains a poem called Lost Youth. It is implausibly enough, though Hardy might just have brought it off, a dialogue in a junk shop between a gun and a comboloi, a set of worry beads. Ston dico cario fili stechi cremasto, asi mo kendis meno ki macrilicno. On the wall hands a flintlock, adorned with silver, long and slim. The flintlock cries out, Master, come, master, come and take me, that I may be renewed in your hands, proud master mine, pride of the clefts and death to Turk. Wrap yourself in your shroud and stride forth, and let me not die here of rust. 
I in my youth had comrades, muskets and thousands like myself. And if I cannot, as before, turn at your hands into a thunderbolt of liberty, then fill for one last time my famished guts and open fire, that I may fall and die and shatter in pieces in thunder, flashing light and white cloud. Some topicality is lent to the theme in a poem also in the same book, with the date appended now, War Dances, October 1885, one of the dances being the dance of the old men. Our hair has gone white in this life of inaction, the thunder of musket, the battlegrounds roar, now come to our minds every so often, like echoes of some sea swell afar, which rains on and envelops our dearly loved homeland, from which we now find ourselves sadly exiled. Aspri Santa Mariama se apra isori, to tu fecu of rondos, these magis isori. The meter, unmistakably, is that of the battle hymn by Urigos Ferreos, the proto-martyr of the revolution, before it came about in 1798, depicted in a famous painting on the poster for this lecture. The historical context, 1885, is an upsurge of patriotic sentiment in response to worrying political developments to the north in Bulgaria and eastern Romania in September 1885. It's as if the musket for Greek poets is what the Irish call the pike in the thatch, always handy when the next bit of trouble comes along. The poem goes on, more ambivalently, perhaps, we wistfully set aside musket and sword, and our feckless sons hung up those very arms which won their freedom to rust in idleness. Now with the call to arms we are enfeebled by age, once in our hands our muskets were death-dealing lightning bolts. But we still have prayer, and when our old Turk-killing company now in death's embrace hear the first musket ring out, they shall fly eagerly back to earth as unseen angels, where you, the young, launch the attack. Anotan totu feki to proto akusti, when the first gunshot is heard again, so much of Greek poetry has dreamed of renewed gunfire in this way. Palamas can be more circumspect and I think true to himself. In his homecoming sequence from 1897, he writes, Sedentary, I travelled to another land and there dug deep and hoarded up my treasure. And with a hand unhandy with a rifle, I patiently beat out the crowns of art. The tension between art and action emerges most ambivalently in the canons from a 1912 collection about Missolonghi in a quieter vein. There we find cannons nailed to the abandoned ramparts of the city and the warriors are long gone. Small children bestride the cannons in play and boys impiously scratch girls' names on them. At night they return to ghostly life of a kind, but their powers to flash forth lightning now gone, they curse their lot. Aqua nimbora lastraxon cataliende. Lurking in this line is Palamas's sense, which he voiced elsewhere in a critical piece, that the revolution had never yet found its poet, and that he himself was not that poet. It's interesting just to glance for a moment at Palamas's arch rival, the one Greek poet who stays aloof from guns altogether, and who is yet the most celebrated among all Greek poets in the modern era. Cavafy, ardent advocate of Greek national claims that he was, and a close and admiring reader of the Cleftic songs too, avoids the whole theme like poison. For him, the din of poetic gunfire seems to become quite deafening. Not so a poet, Cavafy rightly admired Angelos Sicilianos, a distant relation of Alorites. In his neglected poems from the time of the Balkan Wars in 1912 to 13, he wrote with a fervour akin to D'Annunzio's and came in these years as close to the proto-fascist spirit. His poem, Our Lady of Consolation, which appeared in 1913 in a magazine and then an anthology of uplifting war poetry, is a prayer to the Virgin as shield of the Greeks at the Epirot front. And the magazine's front page bore the legend in large letters, Yanina has fallen. To be sure, the Virgin has been associated with um, martial imagery since the Song of Songs and in Orthodox tradition. Yet Sikilianos' hallowing of weapons goes further Mary's church contains gilded votive bullets in this poem, and it is from her consoling beauty that the rifle takes on what it owns of grace. The blend of the devotional and the bellicose crystallises in a particularly 
memorable phrase, where rifle there is censor, that is, incense will bless guns, but gun smoke is itself a purifying incense. Much later, the same poet's resistance poems, courageously issued in 1942, draw on the memory of the revolution, but wisely forego this kind of rhetoric. In any case, though the Balkan Wars were a triumph for Greek arms, disaster would follow. 1921 was not exactly a celebratory centenary, with Greece engaged in a losing war with the Turks. And the gunshot which the interwar period in poetry heard most clearly was that of the pistol that the mordant young poet Karyotakis turned on himself in 1928. But he fired off a couple of poetic salvos first in his third and last collection, Elegies and Satires. They reflect the death of the ideals of the 21 following the disastrous defeat at the hands of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk in 1922. One interesting example is a parody of Kalgos's odes, which Karyotakis writes addressed to the long dead poet. It begins by hailing him, servitude's barbarous darkness was torn apart by letters of fire, by the lightning of arms and by your own stern virtue. Yet Greece, as Karyotaki sees it, is now run by pygmies. Heroes do battle in the dance halls. That is, not with guns, but with dastardly stilettos. The Greeks have been defeated at the Sakaria, Sangarios, and liberty is now a barracks prostitute passed from man to man. A comparable kind of disillusionment with the gun may be heard in the poem by George Seferis in 1935, evoking Ivra, that island of naval heroes, and probably echoing Palamas's cannons at Missolonghi. The harbour is too old, I can't go on waiting, not for the friend who left for the island with the pine trees, not for the friend who left for the island with the plane trees, not for the friend who left for the open sea. I stroke the rusty cannons, I stroke the oars for my body to come back to life and to take some decision. Part of the point here, I think, is that Seferis, an exile from his native Smyrna, is a stranger to the mainland Greek tradition and feels confined in the small and stifling Greek state. And this is a reminder that cleftic songs and the naval exploits of the 21 had local connections, which Greeks from further afield could and did learn of at school, but didn't necessarily connect with emotionally. Logbook two later on was perhaps Seferis' best poetry book, and perhaps the best poetry book to come out of the Second World War anywhere. But with great tact, you don't hear a gun in it anywhere. This isn't pacifism, but an honourable refusal on the part of a diplomat to adopt the mantle of the resistance. Well, they say as Elitis, who served at the Albanian front himself, rose to the challenge of the question, what could the muse add to what is bruited abroad by rifle and cannon, as an old poet from Missolonghi wrote, in 1940. Elitis rose to the channels and reached his high point, I think, with his poem, the cumbersome title, Lay Heroic and Funereal for the Fallen Second Lieutenant of the Albanian Campaign, published in 1945. Its debt to Lorca is clear and well documented, but the details are all integrated into an indigenous tradition drawing on the memory of the 21 in a fortifying way. Quote one short section. He was a gallant lad with his dull gold buttons and his pistol, with a man's air to his stride and his helmet a gleaming mark. They hit his brain with such ease he never knew what hit him. His men to left and right and vengeance on wrong up ahead, fire on lawless fire. With the blood above his eyebrows, the Albanian mountains thundered, then melted the snows to wash his body clean. Fire on fire here is the phrase, the very phrase we met in the Song of Christos Milionis. And Elitis' closing phrase echoes Valoritis' Demos and his flintlock, where the wind was called on to drop, lest Olympus and Pindus learn of Themos' death and melt their snows for sorrow. Elitis, in a different section, goes so far as to echo not just the content, but the form of Greek folk song. Oh, do not look, oh, do not look to see from where, from where life left him. Do not say how, do not say how the smoke of a dream went up. Just like that, then the single moment, just like that, then the single, just like that, then the single moment left the last behind. And just like that, the sempiternal sun, the world. 
Elitis is recasting the meter of Klefdig song for a new cause now, the cause of the war against totalitarianism. He subtly varies the theme of the wounded cleft, common in cleftic poetry, and also avoids the cod folkloric air of many Soviet-inspired poems of the period. The power of the passage I've just read is that it takes a form, Greek lament, traditionally the prominence of women, and then reproduces with some fidelity the repetition of whole and half lines which you get when folk song is actually sung. None of this could have been written without Phalaretis' smoking gun behind it, but it's all renovated and transcended. A more ludic kind of surrealism inspired poem, but by no means in jest, and now reflecting resistance not to Mussolini's invasion, but to the even darker time of the Axis occupation, is Nikos Engonopoulos' Bolivar, a Greek poem, 1944. He pronounces it uh, Bolivar on the Greek way. And it revolves around a morally ambivalent protagonist of the 21, Odysseus Andrutsos, and Simon Bolivar, a man who had his own 1821 revolution. Bolivar, name of metal and wood, your great hand was as big as your heart and it scattered blessing and curse. You ranged over the mountains and the stars trembled. You came down to the plain with the guilt, the epaulets, all the marks of your rank, musket held to your shoulder. In his copious notes to the poem, part of which, uh, the project of which is, I suppose, um, paradoxical and, if you like, postmodern, but in his copious notes to the poem, Engonopoulos glosses many elements which attest to its diverse Greekness, the kind of Greekness he values, and therefore its resistance potential. In this present case, he notes a folk song. What sort of chieftain are you who bear no musket? The poet, who had himself fought in Albania, it should be noted, subtly exploits the affinity of the gun with writing. With a hard stone, I scratch your name on the rock for men later to come on pilgrimage. Sparks leap forth as I scratch, such they say was Bolivar, and I watch my hand as it writes, bright in the sun. Here the pen is transformed, so to speak, into a gleaming polished flintlock. A third and last example, with greater cultural specificity, uh, of the 1821 is this. Come, come, dismount, let the cans be mounted, swab the muscles, lit fuses to the ready, mortars to the right, vras, Vras in the Albanian tongue, open fire, Bolivar. This is culturally specific, acknowledging the poet's own Albanian antecedents. And as a footnote indicates, citing a cousin's testimony, Vras was the command issued by Admiral Kunduljotis to his men in a sea fight as late as 1912. Engolopoulos' poem is in part a tribute to the Albanian strain which Andrusos II represents. Most influential from this period, and perhaps most inventive, is Yanis Ritz's Romeo Sini, written in 1945 to 7, published in 1954. This poem in seven parts, celebrated for its musical setting by Theodorakis, has a title which is notoriously impossible to translate. Romeos, literally Roman, is the identifier Greeks have traditionally used for themselves. In this context, Romeo Sini might be thought of as the Greeks on the back foot. These trees are not at home with less sky. These stones are not at home under a foreign tread. These faces are not at home except in the sun. These hearts are not at home except with right. And in the third stanza of the first poem, the description of the resistance in the landscape, compare of course the French Maquis, zooms in on the gun specifically. The hand of each is welded to a rifle. Their rifle is an extension of the hand. Their hand is an extension of their soul. On their lips is wrath, and deep, deep in their eyes is sorrow, like a star in a salt pan. The hand of each is welded to a rifle. And that gives them the struggle, the strength to continue the struggle. Out of bread, out of bullets, now they load their cannons with their hearts alone. The poem with gliding transitions weaves in many levels of Greek indomitability though with the 21 as the strongest sin single element. But we go back as far as Odysseus and the Byzantine border lord, the Eunice. We have Solomos's free besieged of Missolonghi, of course, but also the interned communists of Nafplio between the wars. 
And the language of international left surrealism, the poem was completed the year the AK-47 was patented, takes on a Greek Orthodox hue. Important too is that the pathetic fallacy in which Valoritis had a tendency to wallow is used here with great subtlety. Yet Ritsos' beautiful poem can provoke unease. We'd have no inkling that it was written not during the occupation, but in conditions of internecine bloodletting that followed. The implicit claim that to be on the wrong side is simply to be un-Greek is troubling, even when the poem's allegiances are expressed so artfully. For some of Ritsos' friends, and they were many, disillusionment would creep in, especially after the invasion of Hungary in 1956. Take these lines from Titos Patricios in the year that followed. That is why I no longer write to supply paper rifles, guns made of prolix empty words. This precisely was the challenge to the poet who was engagé. Rhetorical rifles could only fire blanks. Yet some poets simply couldn't dispel the sound of gunfire which had scarred their youth and contaminated as it blended with the echoes of the clefts and the men of the 21. Take the pathologist, painter and poet Takis Sinopoulos, who had fought in the civil war against left-led insurgents. His Feast of the Dead, written in the first half of the 1960s and published in 1972 under the Colonel's dictatorship, a dictatorship which truly was a discredit to the profession of arms, uh, not least through the way it celebrated the 150th anniversary of the revolution in 1971. This collection is at once disrupted, uh, sharpened and given shape by the sound of gunfire that runs through it. The opening poem, Sophia and Other Stuff, begins with the vision of a bathing beauty who obsesses the poet and moves on to daily troubles and wrangles. The life of a GP, the we a wheedling brother, nagging women, a grumpy tailor. And then before a shift back to the beach and a different siren, Litsa, whom the poet remembers with exasperation, he's forgotten to telephone, this. And there I was in the riverbed, prone, the devil of a wind from the bent ravine, sheer mountains up above, the machine guns mowing away, echoing sounds, thousands of stones breaking into millions of stones, the sun unmoving high above, engendering suns. No muskets here now, but machine guns, tapoli vola ferizan, and the echoes in the ravine are fragmented, not as in Valoritis poetry, showing the harmony of Greek nature and Greek valour. So too in the following poem, again with a woman for title, Magda. And as the fusillades went on, mowing the beach below, we breathless crawl away, day on the way out, burrowed behind that iron door, and suddenly the thud above our heads, and then the next thud, the next thud, the next thud. I trembled at the sound. This might seem like generic war poetry, but another stanza establishes the poem's connection to memories of the clefts and the 21 specifically. So many years had elapsed since when they were born, grew up, took rifle, knife, axe, whatever was to hand, left, went. The title poem, Feast of the Dead, Necrotypnos, begins with a daydream about the war dead who gradually accrue in a Homeric catalogue of names. But not Homeric alone. The cleftic songs and some poems of Valoritis are dense with the names of fighters. The muster in Sinopoulos' poem offers consolation and companionship, again, once again, to certain cleftic songs. But then the poem once again swerves away. Off downhill we went, ashes everywhere, scorched earth, cold steel, doors door to the black X from which you knew that death had been here, day and night with the machine guns as we mowed away. The black X or Kai marks where Colonel Grivas' right wing death, west death squads have been. The machine guns are now in the hand of the speaker, friend and foe are becoming hard to distinguish. All this so different from the staged duels of the nationalist presentation of Greekness with its revolutionary heritage in poetry. The downhill path for Sinopoulos is clearly a moral one, not the rousing descent of raiding clefts like a wolf on the fold, which runs through the cleftic songs. And history continues to march through Sinopoulos' poem, becoming more specific as it draws to a close. 
Then came the days of 44 and the days of 48, and from the Peloponnese as far as Larissa, and all the way to Castoria, a black contamination spreading over the map. The toponyms resemble superficially those of the Clefetic Songs or memoirs of the 21, yet are differently presented. The cue for healing comes in the second and final companionable gathering of dead men, in which one of the men's broken rifle seems to symbolise the pacifist rather than the merely powerless. But this too doesn't last till the end of the collection. Particularly disturbing in a disturbed book are the days dry as rifle shots, Merisk seres sandufe kies, which sound all too like the killing of captives, reprisals which marked the Greek Revolution and of course the Greek Civil War. Sinopoulos' experience left him with intense guilt that took decades to exorcise and meant refashioning the inherited place of the gun in Greek poetry. In Feast of the Dead, the gun becomes what it is and what some earlier Greek poems have elided, an instrument of death. Comparable scruples could be expressed from the left-hand side of politics, and they were. A late prose poem by another physician poet, Manolis Anagonostakis, recalls his great courage as a student pitted against collaborators in occupied Salonika, but he doesn't present it as courage at all. We were keeping lookout, the three of us, on the corner of Arian Street and Olympia Street. Each clutched his revolver and in the wide pocket, wide pocket of a jacket bulging just as in the latest George Raft film. At eight on the dot could be heard a burst of machine gun fire and shortly thereafter scattered shots. At five past eight, Alanis came to tell us to disperse. I went with him as far as Hegnatia Street. The easy job, he said. When we went into the den, we found them all lying on the rug, completely stoned. We opened fire as easy as that, a single burst. Not one moved, not a squeak, eight of them. Now the neighbourhood can breathe again with your pieces thugs out of the way. Take the revolver, I said. I don't have anywhere to stow it tonight. I noticed my voice. Alanis noticed it too. I get it, he said. You're not used to it yet. That too, I said. To be sure, these malefactors deserved no better. But they were killed not in hot blood, but cold by single shots following the machine gun spraying. And Anna Grostaki seems to wonder, are the young resistance men only resistance in the noblest sense, or are they in part playing a part in, by, inspired by American gangster movies? This would be even more so if we read a hint at George Raft's alleged mob connections. Well, the whole matter of guns and guilt, not that the Greeks were at fault in being invaded and occupied, issued in a particularly elaborate and countercultural form in a poem by Andreas Embirikos, the founder of Greek surrealism. Not least because Embirikos was in 1924-5 a student of his college, and not least because the spur for his poem was a book written by a professor here, I end the body of my lecture with this example. The poem is The Road from 1964. I don't care for trigger warnings, but perhaps one is in order here, because this is a poem which has at its heart very different memories of the Greek Revolution. We've heard of heroic fusillades and daring duels, and also, of course, of scruples and traumas. Here, for the first time, are scenes of men, some of them innocent, at gunpoint. In Bidikos' prose poem begins with a utopian traffic jam of holidaying vehicles, but then takes a darker turn when we casually encounter a scene of sexual violence. And then this next turbulent passage, or one sentence, and don't worry, this just now about the details. That command of ill omen halt that once brought such terror to the souls of wayfarers when daggers flashed and flintlocks or car rifles held to the chests of travellers, when on that road ill fate cast them into the hands of robber rebels who in their filthy kilts as they burst forth from the mouth of some cave were like the lads of Odyssea Sandruzos as if the place were a gravia inn, and these travellers, soldiers of Kyose Mehmet or of O Omer Priori, just as when they set out from Picermi on the way past Daup and Delhi, from that road into less trodden paths, they led the lords, blonde boys of England who came to Greece and were made saints, the bandits goading them on with sabres, 
O Edward Herbert, O Viner, De Boyle and Lloyd, till they reached safe lairs, hard by the harbour of Oropos, Thelissy Way, for a king's ransom or for the knife, in Salon of a slaughter sheep, in Crisor they slaughter rams, for a king's ransom or for slaughter, just see the seas and death has picked to carry me off, as winter drew to an end and Easter nigh, and everywhere was fragrant with pine and thyme, for a king's ransom or for slaughter, O Tacos Arvanitaikis, O Christos Arvanitaikis, O Yero Yanis, and you, sad Katarachas, for a king's ransom or for slaughter, hard by the harbour of Oropos, Vilesi Way. The poem will end in the ecstatic vein of Whitman and of Ambilicos' friend Allen Ginsberg, with the claim that the road to follow in the end is that of the beatified and beatific poets. But here at the poem's heart, Ambilicos draws us right into Greek history and 1821 in particular, and in the most unsettling way. On the one hand, we hear the famous words of the martyred hero Athanasius Iakos, which inspired a long poem by Valoritis, just see the seas and death as picked to carry me off. No words of a bonnie fighter can match the resonance of these when the 21 is remembered. And yet on the other hand, the Battle of Rabia in, a key victory for Greek forces in May 1821, appears in Mbidikos' poem from the point of view of the vanquished Ottomans who were given no quarter. It's also tangled up with two later stories of kidnapping, brigandage, murder, and arguably judicial murder, What's afoot here. The names called on, the English names, are those of the young grand tourists kidnapped at Vila in 1870, held for ransom by brigands and killed when negotiations went wrong. The brigands in their turn were guillotined and a picture of their heads hanging from their long hair like a string of onions is well known. They too are addressed by name in the poem. Needless to say, the incident placed great strain on British-Greek relations. Suddenly it might be felt that the old clefts were no more than brigands and that Greece was a bandit state, a failed state. Later, of course, relations could be repaired and were. But too late for those unfortunate young men who were made saints, as the poem says, in the two fine churches and a window in my undergraduate college were erected to their memory. The horrible story all told, the 11-year-old Costis Palamas wrote a short story about it at the time, and narrated in the book which inspired Embiricus's poem, The Vilesi Murders, 1961, by the then Corais Professor at King's, Romilly Jenkins. Seemingly scarred by what the 1940s had brought on in Greece, uh, Jenkins was turning, his successor Cyril Mango has acknowledged, towards a simply and boldly racialist claim that what ailed modern Greece was the Albanian race which had brought it into being. But why did Jenkins' strange book so grip Embiricos? Because Embiricos had himself been kidnapped by bearded insurgents in the chaotic days that followed the end of the German occupation in December 1944, and he'd been marched to the area where the Vilesi murders had occurred, and his term robber rebels here. The trauma could be dispelled only after the passage of 20 years through the writing of this prose poem in which the rhythms of resistance, the measures of the cleftic songs, which had so often brought solidarity, solace and quite rightful pride, those measures rumble ominously beneath the level typographical surface of prose. Otan magieria astraftan ke cariophilia e graves. You can hear the poet's own LP recording of this poem on YouTube now, eight heart-stopping minutes. In the central paragraph, it's to be noted, the Greek brigands emerge from the mouth of a cave using the same word buka as we use of a gun barrel, as if the landscape itself abets the deeds of blood, but not in the nature-worshipping manner of Kalbos or, of course, Valoritis. This isn't, to be sure, the Greek revolution of school textbooks or of anniversary celebrations. Yet Mbirikos is a Greek, sure enough, and in another poem from just the same period, he hymns the glory of the Hellenes, and for that matter, the Philhellenes. In the road, however, this poet and psychoanalyst seems to find his own mind, at least, haunted by the nightmares of the revolution as much as by its vision of unity. To conclude, men of letters should always handle guns with care, whether they're real or poetic. This is noted poignantly in a recent poem by Dionysius Capsalis about the Irish neoplatonist Stephen McKenna. The young McKenna pitches up in Greece 
with a combined corps of volunteers from France to go to war in the war of 97, but one month later is discharged without ever firing a rifle shot. Not that he knew the first thing about guns. Greek poets, from the anonymous singers who celebrated the clefts to the conscript soldiers, truly food for powder, and the battle-hardened insurgents of later times, have on, often known of guns all too well, and when they haven't, as with Solomos, they've done well not to claim to. The black American activist, formerly known as H. Rapp Brown, who adopted the freedom or death slogan used in the initial advertising for this lecture, famously expressed the view that violence is as American as cherry pie. If we observe that violence is as Greek as cheese pie, tiropitha, that is a comment on human nature, not, of course, on the Greeks. The 21 was many things. The cause of liberty, equality, fraternity, a religious war, a collective ebullition of rugged individualism. And as with each and every war of independence the world over, a civil war. Memories of the revolution fortified the Greeks for their greatest moment of unanimity and magnanimity, the struggle against Mussolini in the winter of 1940 to 1941. But the cultural legacy of pitiless brigandage and warlordism also cast a long shadow, and this all poets of calibre have known. Echoes of the Greek revolution in world poetry swiftly died away, but the presence of the gun in Greek poetry, up to Michalis Kalas and Nasafayonas today, and in subtle late examples from Ritsos too, resonates still. The distant reading methodology of the Stanford Literary Lab might provide interesting insights here. Where and why in a digital corpus of modern Greek poetry would we find the highest concentrations of references to muskets and other guns, aggregating like marks on a target? In the revolutionary period, to be sure, and at later times of conflict, when men dreamt of drinking delights of battle with their peers, 1897, 1912, 1940. But also in times of peace, when poetic gunplay runs the risk of being simply trigger happy, clouds of gunpowder, volleys of meaningless rhetoric, plain old misfires. In listening closely to some Greek voices tonight, I've tried to be attentive to those places where gunfire echoes through the two centuries of Greek poetry since the revolution of 1821, and to ask why and how it does. Let me end with some lines I've had occasion to quote us where, and which put all this in a longer Greek perspective, a much longer Greek perspective, echoing both Homer and the cleftic lang landscape and language as they do. Clepaisissimos Lorenzatos, who worked briefly for the BBC, at Bush House across the road for King, from Kings and now part of Kings. Before that, Lawrence Atlas had fought in the Second World War, which reflected the heritage of the Greek Revolution at its mettlesome best. I learned my Homer on the Albanian campaign, up in the Metsobo mountains, mantled in fir trees and wrapped in a bitter wind from Thrace, while in the distance the cannon echoed with a sound like torrents in midwinter dashing themselves against their narrow sided gorges. A shepherd stopped to listen. The distant shepherd trembling hears the sound. As thousands of years ago, he stood and heard it. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The awkwardness of this, our common situation, is fully mitigated in my case by the honor of having been chosen to give a vote of thanks to Professor David Ricks for what I was sure would be no less than a learned and inspiring lecture. The Greek Revolution, described by British diplomacy at the time as the untoward event, rightly occupies center stage in our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. This year's bicentenary, coming at a time of need, distress and confusion, is nevertheless an opportune moment for all of us to ponder and in our isolated homes make room for the exigencies of transnational understanding to which poetry has long given a voice 
whether feeble or vibrant. There is a paradox here. Poetry is singularly an art which, in the words of Palamas, knows only a fatherland, Xeri Monopatrida, for the simple reason that it can speak with authority only in the tranquility or the turbulence of the mother tongue, the parlar materno. Nevertheless, poetry is also the most adept interpreter of world literature, first envisioned by Goethe. That great reservoir of emotions, imaginings, and ideas in which is fondly kept such stuff as our common humanity is made on. Professor Rix's lecture tonight paid eloquent tribute to both aspects of this paradoxical coextension of the local and the universal, the one within the other. To me, it was like a breath of fresh air in its gentle persistence that poetry may be very important in its own right and in its own way, to the extent that it can harbor something very important other than or beyond its own way. The shot heard around the world, I'm sure you will agree with me, that one could hardly find a more apt way to approach the force of poetry, especially at a time when it seems most of us, even when glued onto an unrelenting screen, have become avid listeners hearkening after a word, a meaning, a sense of it all that may lead us out again and into the world at large. The short heard around the world, a dazzling tour through two centuries of modern Greek poetry takes us to the heart of the matter, to poetry as we can hear it, poetry as an oral or an auditory event, and eventually an event that takes place within a very peaceful, hardly war-ridden and wasted locus, the Temple of Hearing, as Rilke famously called it. In this senseless profusion of voicings and screenings to which a good part of our lives has been reduced, to hear the voice of poetry speak out with such clarity, beauty, and moral precision, and on a subject so crucial to our understanding of ourselves, is a rare occasion, a gift for which we can only thank Professor David Ricks. His capacity, sustained by deep learning and bred by years of study of comparative literature, to span the entire length and breadth of the Greek language and follow the shade of Homer, where it may still rest in a turn of phrase by a contemporary poet, or around a corner of Stavio Street, his incomparable ability to hear affinities no one has heard before, with a fine ear attuned not to war and war's alarms, but to the art and craft of poetry, a humble occupation. His unassuming way of spinning masterful translations of Greek poetry, a demanding craft in which David Ricks habitually excels, as we all witnessed, all these bespeak the generosity of his scholarship, to echo a word used by Professor Van Steen, and all made for a unique experience in tonight's lecture. And it is all about hearing, about the sound of sense, about stopping to listen. Thus, we clearly heard Solomon's harsh and jarring consonants in the hymn to liberty. Akuo kufia tatufekia. Akos miximo spathion, ako oxila, ako pelekia, ako triximo dondion. 
for which David Ricks devised corresponding alliteration and rhythm. I hear the crack of muskets, I hear the clash of blades, I hear staves, I hear axes, I hear the grinding of teeth. And then we heard Calvus in his ode to Sully. Ako, ako ton thorivon os archomenis machis, kufofrondai tiutos ote pano isus vachus lichnete i thalasa. Ako, ako, I hear, I hear. And yes, we all heard, we were all led to hear the echo of that first shot fired in the name of liberty resonate through cliftic songs, the prose of Macriyanis, the poetry of Solomos and Calvos, Rangavis and Balauritis, all the way to Palamas and Sikilanos. We heard the tragic echo of the suicidal shot fired in Previsor. We heard gunfire reverberate through war, occupation and resistance in Elitis and Gonopoulos and Ritsos. And then we heard the mournful suspension of gunfire, of firearms silenced, as it were, in reverence and awe of those who shed their blood, in Sefer's logbook too, which I enthusiastically concur with David Ricks, is the best book of poems to come out of the Second World War. We heard it again in the post-war poetry of those torn asunder by the moral complexities of civil conflict in Titos Patricios, Takis Sinopoulos, and Manolis Anagnostakis. We heard it travel the long distance from the cleftic musket to the rifle in the mountains of Albania and then to the machine gun of the civil war. We heard gunfire glorified in the cause of revolution and then we heard the gunfire of execution at the break of dawn. Its terrifying echo reminding us of the dark fate that befell those held at gunpoint in a city or on the road. And then we heard it all in Andreas and Birikus' shudder of understanding in a prose poem written many years after those fearful days of December of 1944 when he was held hostage by Elas and taken to a sanctified site he was sure would be his place of execution. We heard guns fired at both friend and foe, guns that hit the target and guns that missed it, guns that killed and guns that wounded and maimed, guns that misfired, guns literally fired and others that resolved themselves into a metaphor, as in the Meres Xires Santufekes of Takisinopoulos. Yes, we heard it all. We heard it in memory of those who gave their lives for us, their comfortable descendants. And then we heard it at a time, our time, when ignorant armies once again unfurl the frightful colors of fanaticism around the globe. We heard shots fired in the cause of liberty and at the limit of human endurance at Missolonghi. And we heard the agonizing cry of innocent victims in Tripolica. We heard victorious shots and we heard the shouts of senseless slaughter. And what we heard, what we in fact and gratitude heard all the wondrous way to the most moving end of the lecture and in the much longer Greek perspective disclosed in the words of Zismos Lorenzatos. What we heard was the benevolent voice of poetry, a breath of wind as of a spirit coming from afar to which we can all listen in reverence, like silent shepherds in a Homeric landscape. Thank you very much indeed, David Ricks.